Alrighty. Whoops, what am I doing here? Let me put that back up there for a second. Had a question on the chat. Can you unshare the screen? Did you see that? Okay, sure. Okay, I won't share it again then. Eric, um, all right. On behalf of the Tug Hill Commission, Region 6 of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and the Hamilton, Herkimer, Jefferson and Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation Districts, we are pleased that you can join us for this virtual piece of the Black River Watershed Conference. This is the second of seven webinars, which were originally planned for our in-person 10-year anniversary conference. We really hope to be able to hold this in person again in 2021. We miss you all. The entire schedule of webinars is available on our website at www.tughill.org. A couple of housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded recorded and will be posted on the commission's website when it's done. You're all muted to reduce background noise, but if you do have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and please keep all your questions focused on the Black River watershed. Our first speaker today is Christine Watkins. She's the executive director of the Jefferson County Soil and Water Conservation District and the chair of the Jefferson County Water Quality Coordinating Committee. She has worked in the natural resources management field for almost 30 years and is a certified crop advisor and certified nutrient management planner. Her presentation will cover the Emerald Ash Borer and its impacts, and it will also highlight a county assessment done by the Soil and Water Conservation District. So remember, trees provide a whole host of ecological, social, and economic ben benefits for our communities, but they also provide a st um, stormwater volume and water quality benefits. So a decrease in canopy could mean decreased stormwater benefits and possibly a decrease in water quality of the receiving bodies. So without further ado, uh, Chris, Christine, take it away. Thanks, Jen. Sure. So, um, as Jen said, um, I'm with the Soil and Water District in Jefferson County. I will preempt my presentation to say I am not a forester. Um, so if you have any forestry type questions, um, you can certainly email me um, after the event. Um, but this is basically information that was gathered through our um, forester that we have on staff. So first, we're going to do a question, um, and if you can answer this using the chat box, what color are the EAB bait traps that are used by DEC? I'm sure most of you have seen them out there. Um, Got an answer from Tim, from Angie, from Haley. Yes, you're all correct, Scott. They're all saying purple. Purple, that is correct. Very good. So why are we talking about the emerald ash borer and why are we talking about it in regards to water quality? Um, so here's a shot of the Black River watershed. And as you can see by the legend, um, we have a lot of wooded acres within the watershed. More than half the drinking water in the US originates in forest. And so you can see by this picture um, exactly how important it is um, within, the New York, within the Black River watershed which um, as you most know is a drinking water source for a variety of communities. Um, in Jefferson County, it is the uh, primary source for the city of Watertown and also for the Fort Drum Army installation and a variety of other communities. Um, emerald ash borer and water quality. As Jen already alluded to, um, trees help manage and reduce runoff. Um, the leaf canopy can reduce the erosive effects of rain um, the roots take up water, and promote water infiltration, and one tree can reduce runoff by about 59 gallons a year. And of course, that number is going to change as that uh, tree grows. Healthy forests can also help to withstand invasive species pressure. So basically, a healthy trees equals a healthy watershed. Um, Trees are a key component of um, green infrastructure practices, uh, which Michelle will talk about in her presentation, 
and they are the uh, primary um, species used in riparian buffers to help protect water quality. The emerald ash borer is an invasive beetle that came from Asia. Um, it infests and kills North American ash trees. It came to the U.S. in the mid-90s. Um, presently, there are 35 states that it is um, president. Um, it was identified in New York State in 2009. Um, to date, all counties in New York State, except for seven, um, have documented the um, EAB within their borders. Um, in Jefferson County, it was documented in Clayton in 2019. Um, within the Black River watershed for the other counties, uh, Lewis, Hamilton, and Herkimer, um, they have no documented cases. Um, it is in within Oneida County, but not within the watershed. So why is this a big deal? Um, all of New York's ash trees are susceptible to this insect. Um, ash is a common street tree. Back when the, um, we lost our native elms due to the Dutch elm disease, um, ash was sometimes used to replace those trees. Um, it's a common uh, and valuable forest species. It, it's about 8% of all of New York trees. Um, it's a food source for wildlife, um, commercial, commercially valuable. Um, baseball bats, flooring, furniture. Um, native Americans use it for their basket weaving. Um, and the annual estimated contribution based on forest manufacturing and forest related recreation and tourism is over $9 billion a year in New York State. So that's a huge economic impact. As you can see from this picture for New York State, this is the distribution of ash throughout the state. Um, you can see within the Adirondacks that it is a little sparse compared to the um, counties along Lake Ontario. Um, Jefferson County, as I said, does have the um, ash borer presence. It's also in Oswego and St. Lawrence counties. And most of these locations are along the lake or the uh, river. Um, so there's um, the thought that probably some of this distribution may be because of the water. Um, I do believe that it's also present in um, Ontario, also in Canada. So what are its impacts? Um, since, it, since it came to the U.S., um, it has killed over hundreds, killed hundreds of millions of ash trees. Um, New York State DEC and also USDA um, have issued quarantines and fines to prevent the spread of this organism through infested trees, logs, or firewood. Many of you may be familiar with the firewood um, regulations. Um, if you go to any convenience store, you may see um, parcels of wood that you can buy that you are encouraged to buy if you're going camping so you don't transport it from one area to another. It also has cost municipalities, property owners, uh, nursery operators, and forest product industries hundreds of millions of dollars. It is a prohibitive invasive species. Um, and again, this goes back to um, it is you, you can't sell, transport, introduce, or propagate. So the biggest issue there is the transport of it. How does EAB kill the ash trees? Well, first we have the beetle, um, it's a very uh, brilliant colored beetle, um, so it's probably uh, fairly easy to identify. It creates a D-shaped hole um, as it emerges from the trees. Um, these adults don't fly very far, so again this leads back to um, the rationale that probably most of the um, uh, primary way that this uh, insect moves around is transport within wood products. The larvae feed on the inner bark um, and they're basically disrupting the tree's ability to transport water and nutrients. Um, basically it's starving the tree to death. Some of the symptoms, um, blonding, which is where large strips of the bark fall off. Um, as you can see in this photo here, some of the bark has fallen off and you can see these S-shaped larval galleries. Um, this is where the larva, larva are um, feeding on the um, uh, inner bark of the tree. 
Um, sometimes you will also see increased woodpecker activity because obviously they are going after the, uh, the, the larva in the tree. Um, ultimately, you will start to see canopy dieback. The picture on the left um, shows um, canopy dieback in its early stages. Um, and then it can progress to what you see on the right. Um, one of the tough things to, um, that makes it sometimes difficult to diagnose just from looking at the canopy is that there are other uh, diseases that ash trees get. Um, so sometimes you really need to be able to find the, um, the pest itself to diagnose that it's from um, EAB. The ash trees typically will die within three to five years after they get infected by the tree or by the bug. Um, again, this is dependent upon the, the density of the population and the tree health. Um, so a bigger population of EAB, um, the more likely it's going to cause the death of the tree sooner. Um, a young, strong, healthy tree may be able to withstand the pressures of EAB for longer than a older decayed tree. Um, once these trees are infested, they lose 80% of their structural integrity. So this is one of um, the big reasons to look at these trees and how they affect us in our landscape because they are susceptible to catastrophic failure and they can snap, which basically snap, snap off at the base and collapse. Um, Jen was talking earlier how it sounds like we're supposed to have some high winds tomorrow. So again, a good situation where um, limbs could come down in a, in a windstorm, um, making it more dangerous for those on the road um, and in our communities. So another quick quiz for you. Um, please put your answer in the chat box. But which one of these is white ash? Number one, two, three, or four? Oh, got some answers. Haley, Joe, Tim, they're all saying number one. That's correct. Number one Linda. is white ash, um, two is sugar maple, three is sumac, and four is beech. Good job. So um, as I said before, um, at the Soil and Water Office here, we do have a forester on staff and we are responsible for management of 5,500 acres of county reforestation property. So as we talked with our counterparts in Oswego and St. Lawrence County about Emerald Ash Borer, um, we felt that it was necessary to have a conversation with our county highway department um, to propose doing a survey of the trees along the county roadways. Um, some of the goals for this project, basically to preemptively mitigate the impacts of EAB um, to protect public safety, um, inventory all ash trees along the county roads to create a usable database, prioritize remote prioritize removal efforts, identify trees to potentially treat, and develop future budget needs, and then remove trees before they become too dangerous to do so. So at this point in time, um, items one and two have been completed. Um, we are in the process of working with County Highway to um, go through the data, database with them so that they can start um, looking at particularly item three. So in 2019, um, we had the ability to hire um, three young men out of um, ESF. Um, they all had a background needed to identify trees, which is um, something that was needed to do the survey. So what they did was uh, we assessed the trees within the county right away. Again, we, we kept this restricted to county roads and within the right away, um, the trees were recorded sequentially. Um, each point was uh, logged with a GPS point and then pictures were taken and added as a waypoint. 
Um, and then we conducted a, an assessment. Um, we tailored our assessment to one that was done um, in St. Lawrence County. Um, they had very good luck with uh, what the, the system they used there, so we um, basically used what they had and modified it slightly. So this shows you within Jefferson County um, the roads and the locations of the trees that were assessed. Um, 533 miles of road were driven and approximately 2,500 trees were assessed at just over 1,300 locations. Um, again, as I said, we didn't do town roads, we didn't do state roads, um, we kept specifically to the, uh, to the county highways. So assessment factors. Um, we looked at the diameter of the tree at breast height, DBH. Um, obviously, the bigger the tree, the higher the risk. Um, is the tree dead or alive? Is there a power line? Um, is there a house? And what is the percent crown dieback to the nearest 5%? Uh, we looked at the risk, and each uh, tree was assigned a number for risk. Is it going to fall on the road? Um, will it fall in the road on a house or on a power line? Uh, falling on a road, house, and a power line, and then four, which is the most extreme, it's dead. It has a severe lean over a road, a house, or a power, power line. Um, again, like I said, those points were assigned, one being the least risk and four being the most. Then we looked at the tree health. Um, what was its susceptibility to um, being um, infected by the, the bug and surviving against the bug? Um, a good, strong, vigorous tree was on the low risk end with a one. Um, a tree with more than 25% crown dieback was a two. Um, a split trunk, holes in the tree, disease were a three. And then a dead or um, tree that was on the verge of death was the highest um, risk factor. So we took um, those factors, the, the, um, the size of the tree, the risk factor, and the susceptibility to come up with the hazard factor. Um, a low hazard was a three, and the highest hazard would be a 12. So from that data, um, we had 50 locations that had a hazard rating of nine or above. Um, nine or above was, was assigned a high risk. 418 locations had a hazard rating of six, seven, or eight, which is a moderate risk. And 866 locations had a low risk. So um, obviously uh, good to see that we had a lot of trees that are on the low end of the spectrum there for hazard risk. So I'm gonna jump over to talk a little bit about um, EAB management um, before I finish up talking about the county survey. So um, one of the things that, that's going to be a result of the survey is how do we manage these trees? Um, what do we do with them? And depending upon the location, there's going to be different uh, things that may be done. Uh, for urban trees um, within a city or a, a small community, um, obviously we can look at removing the trees and replacing them with a different tree. Uh, we can treat them with an insecticide until they can be removed, or you can treat them with an insecticide for the duration of the infestation. Um, for a homeowner, um, they're going to be looking at similar management uh, tactics. Um, again, with the road assessment, you, we had some locations where if um, houses and power lines aren't um, nearby, um, even though the tree may be a high risk, um, if it was only going to impact the road, it might give it a lower rating. So um, again, some of those trees may not be looked at as closely as something um, within a densely populated area. For woodland management, um, we are gonna look at things a little bit differently. Um, and again, um, this isn't something that we looked at within this assessment, but I think it's important for people to, to look at as this threat becomes um, you know, more of a possibility of spreading throughout the county. 
Um, if you have a woodlot, um, obviously you want to increase your biodiversity. Um, if you do have ash that it is in your woodlot, if it's greater than 20%, you may want to thin it to reduce it down. Um, there are a number of people that are trying to get ash out of their woodlot lots at this point in time to one, perhaps recoup um, some, some benefit from it, from a monetary benefit before um, prices may absolutely drop. But again, it has to be done in a smart manner. Um, you might want to favor some of the high quality trees to service crop trees. Um, again, we don't want to clean all the ash out. Uh, there is some thoughts that there could be um, some resistant ash out there. And so we want to um, leave some diversity out there. We certainly don't want a clear cut of woodlot because that may encourage invasives and non-desirable species. Um, one of the things we've found with um, management of the county forestation property is that areas that um, have been cut heavily in the past um, tend to get overtaken by um, undesirable species, um, beech and uh, fern. And so we're looking at different ways to um, minimize those impacts so that we're not hindering the regeneration of desirable species. Um, one interesting thing that I've learned is that um, as you're doing regeneration work, you really want to tie it into when um, particular high quality trees uh, release their seed um, so that you have um, a good seed bed and the ability for a new crop of trees to start from what you have in hand. Um, and always look at using a certified professional. Um, they certainly have an idea of what's out there and how to help you manage it, um, whether you're looking at, um, you know, uh, just for the timber value or if you're looking at it for habitat value. So why is it important for communities and, uh, and local governments to have a plan in place for managing ash trees? Um, primarily, dead and damaged trees are a public safety threat. Um, tree comes down in the road, and falls on a car or a car runs into it, obviously there's a liability issue. Um, tree comes down on a home or a power line um, that can certainly affect um, the, the neighborhood. Um, there is a cost associated with uh, whether you're treating or removing, removing these trees. And so you need to really look at those costs to um, calculate your future budget needs. Um, and as these trees increase in size, your treatment and your removal costs will increase also. Um, <clears throat> so part of the economic and ecological value of an ash tree, so using a 20 inch tree as an example, it provides about just under $200 of annual benefit to a single, single family home. Um, this is in stormwater, property value, heating and cooling, carbon sequestration, and improved water quality. Um, stormwater trees are great for intercepting stormwater and helping to um, divert some of the runoff. Um, property value, if anybody has bought or sold a home, uh, most realtors will tell you that trees certainly add to the curb appeal um, and the value of your home. Um, heating and cooling cost, again, a pretty common concept that um, with trees around your home will help to reduce some of those costs of heating and cooling. Um, more and more apparent as we talk about climate change and, and carbon storage is the value that trees have when it comes to carbon sequestration and, again, um, the improvement of air quality. One issue that's going to be a big issue for some of these areas is the community value of that tree. Um, you know, many of us may live in a community with trees that are lined with, you know, um, age old trees that are beautiful and have been there forever and they have a aesthetic value. Um, so now we have to compare the um, economic and ecological value, the community value to the to the potential liability and risk of those trees. 
So coming back to the county um, survey that we did, as I said, we're now in the stage where the, where the county has to assess how are they going to handle these trees to minimize risk? Are they going to treat them? Are they going to remove them? Or are they going to do nothing? So again, using a 20 inch tree as a basis, um, we have a general removal cost of about $1,000. Um, you're obviously going to want to take the stump out too uh, for about a couple hundred dollars. And then um, hopefully in some areas, you're going to want to plant a replacement. So we're looking at about $1,500 for the removal of one 20 inch tree. Treatment. There are treatment methods out there. Um, again, using that 20 inch tree, um, it costs about $10 um, per inch of diameter to treat. So we're talking about $200 um, to treat a 20 inch tree. But we're going to treat this every three years. So roughly over a 10 year period, we're talking about $800. Again, that is um, less than the removal, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. So remove or treat. Um, a lot of it comes down to the size of the tree. Um, younger trees are going to probably uh, react better to treatment. Um, an older tree that is not as healthy more than likely could be a good candidate for removal. Uh, single stem basically means is it a, a single stem? Uh, stem of the tree or does it have multiple stems? Do you have a clump of trees? Again, um, the single stem is going to be a little bit healthier um, and maybe a better candidate for treatment. Is the tree structurally sound? Um, this is probably one of the biggest um, aspects that we need to look at. Is it losing limbs already? Is it split? Does it have decay? Um, a young healthy tree would be more likely um, conducive to try to um, treat and save versus removal. What is the location? Again, what is our objective here? If we are to trying to protect the county highways so that um, we don't have um, um, people driving and running into trees that have fallen down, um, then we may focus on certain areas where we will take some trees out. What's the health of the tree? Um, if we have less than 30% canopy dieback, um, again, might be more likely um, able to use some sort of treatment within that tree. Treatment may not necessarily save the tree, um, but it could prolong its life, um, give us an opportunity to maybe plant something else um, that would we could get established before the tree loot, before the tree ends. Um, and again, if we're looking at a woodlot, um, you might look at it from a different aspect than, um, than a rural or urban setting. So there's, um, there's a lot of variabilities to look at. Um, there are a lot of resources out there to uh, guide you um, making some of these decisions, DEC, has a page that uh, has a lot of resources when it comes to Emerald Ash Borer. Um, in New York State, there are several regions, regional partnerships for invasive species management. Um, within the Black River watershed, we're covered by the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario and also the Adirondack Park Program. Um, county Soil and Water Districts, um, again, depending upon the county, may have staff on board that uh, work with invasives as well as Cornell Cooperative Extension also has staff that um, have knowledge on this end. Um, that's about all I have at this point in time, unless someone has any questions. If there's any questions for Christine, can you add them to the chat for us? Also, uh, Christine, and I wanted to say that in the beginning, um, apparently there's new uh, EAB traps that Emily and uh, Haley had pointed out that they think they're green. Oh, okay. That could yeah. be. We learned something. Good to know. Yep. All right. If there are no questions for Christine, 
I will say thank you. Thank you for all that information. Thank you for all the hard work uh, you and Opie have been doing over there. Um, and I will introduce our next speaker. So Nichelle Swisher is the district manager of the Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation District and the chair of the Lewis County Water Quality Coordinating Committee. She received her master's degree in aquatic ecology from SUNY Brockport and has worked at the district for in soil and water conservation for almost 20 years. Michelle um, worked with the steering committee in creating the original Black River Watershed Management Plan and has worked on several projects and grants that protect water quality in the watershed. One such grant is the Lewis County Fairgrounds Green Infrastructure Grant awarded to the Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation District to install bioretention, water collection, and pervious pavement to reduce and treat stormwater. So take it away, Nichelle. Okay, thank you, Jen. Let me just share my screen. Okay, I would love to say that this is our finished project, but it's not. <laughs> so uh, again, my name is Nichelle Swisher. I uh, work for the Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation District. And the picture that you see right here is actually a finished green infrastructure project on the um, county uh, grounds here. So um, what I'll talk to you about today are one, the Lewis County Fairgrounds Green Infrastructure Project as well, and you'll probably see the, the finished uh, product of the Lewis County uh, DSS office building uh, that we are also, that we share with DSS. Um, so, but I'd first like to start off with a poll and keep everybody um, at the ready. So, Jen, do you wanna put that poll up? So basically, what is green infrastructure? So you have three different options there. They're not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, they're all doing great, Nichelle. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have almost, well, we have a little over half, yeah. Excellent, excellent job, everybody. Okay, so <laughs> I think um, a lot of times, yes, this is, uh, um, we stop, do we stop sharing, Jen? Yeah, I can stop that for you. Um, so a lot of times people um, don't uh, really know what green infrastructure is, but um, if I can get mine to go forward. So um, kind of explanation, it's a cost-effective and a resilient approach to managing wet weather impacts. We have um, significantly stronger storms. I think uh, most of us can recognize we have um, certainly highs and lows. We tend to have droughts more often. We tend to have severe weather uh, more often. Our rainfall comes down harder with more intensity, and that means water moves faster through our infrastructure. So green infrastructure's purpose is to protect, protect the existing ground, protect the existing waterways. Um, it's also meant to restore, restore the hydraulic, hydrologic um, uh, cycle basically so you're actually getting infiltration, you're getting absorption, something that uh, we don't get with the built infrastructure and it mimics mother nature that's what the whole intent of green infrastructure is to mimic uh, mother's nature's way of uh, handling our water so here we have there again mother nature <laughs> so um, mother nature gently absorbs and filters water through the vegetation and soil and it slows and reduces runoff However, in our built infrastructure, we certainly don't want ponding water. We don't want water backing up. We want to get that water off as soon as possible. So our built infrastructure is designed to shoot that water right off of our parking lots and into the, the nearest outlet. So um, it's, we don't have to deal with it. That does cause problems later on down the line. 
So what are these problems? The built environment creates this impervious surface. So not only do you prevent infiltration, but you um, add to it all the pollutants that run off with the stormwater. Then, like I said, because that water doesn't infiltrate, it quickly runs off the surfaces. Water is running faster than it would off of a uh, vegetated or treed surface. So your water's running fast and it at high velocity causes erosion. So what's the problem with erosion? Clearly erosion is bringing not only pollutants but sediment with it and sediment can block your waterways, it can uh, block your culverts and ditches and as well as debris and that blockage can actually lead later on to flooding and like little pockets shown in this picture of water backing up. So just review what does green infrastructure do? It reduces the runoff by slowing water down, allowing it to infiltrate into the, the uh, soil. It treats the runoff and uses basically vegetative uh, vegetation, soils, and other elements to restore the natural processes to, that uh, Mother Nature uses to uh, manage water. So what am I talking about? And you'll see this acorn show up and I'll explain it later. <laughs> so in 2015, we were approached by the fairgrounds, um, Lewis County Ag Society, who owns the Lewis County Fairgrounds, to assist them with a stormwater grant. And this grant basically um, would uh, take care of some of their issues that they have um, on the fairgrounds in terms of water management. In 2016, we started, uh, the fairgrounds had actually started working with an engineer, uh, that's QBK Design and Architects. They uh, had actually created a stormwater plan and it included costs so that we could actually apply uh, through the New York State Consolidated Funding Application um, to the Environmental Facilities Corporation um, for green infrastructure funding. And then in 2017, we were actually able, to, we had word in December, I believe it was that, um, or January, that we um, got uh, funding through EFC for the fairgrounds project. So I like to show this, this big. Um, we were actually awarded $575,000 for the grant. Um, our project has been since scaled back a little bit um, because it was dealing with stormwater and um, some of it was not infiltration, it was just piping. So we had to scale that down a little. But um, here's Scrat. <laughs> Well, so you know, um, he's chasing around. Um, there's been, you know, some uh, interesting things that have come to light when we've done this uh, whole grant program. Um, you know, for example, here you see actually a, a soil breakdown of the fairgrounds. You've got the actual uh, track here. You've got the baseball diamond and the horse arena, as well as animal um, housing and um, your dairy industry building. You've got your ice arena, also called the Forest Park Pavilion, and you have your Nichols building. Well, in the process of this, um, this part actually had to be taken out of the project. So when I go through it, you'll see there's no area four. Area four was more stormwater, not green infrastructure, not treating the runoff, just piping the runoff from the fairgrounds. So um, that had to be um, removed from of the project. So in 2018, we started submitting our information, submitted the design, the memorandum of understanding that we had with the fairgrounds, and um, like I said, the stormwater elements that were uh, eliminated. We did have to revise the MOU. Um, we had to establish the actual owner or, you know, of, of the project. And I'll give you an example. Well, the soil and water was the actual applicant for the fairgrounds project, but the soil and water did not own the fairgrounds. Therefore, we had to file um, a temporary easement um, in order to uh, have some ownership over the fairgrounds to make sure that the best management practices that were installed on the fairgrounds were um, going to be maintained and that we had some kind of say over it through this uh, temporary easement. 
And then um, we were required to have the Ag Society uh, establish a separate fund to ensure that the in-kind will actually be paid because um, the, the fairgrounds is actually paying uh, the in-kind. So along comes 2020, our uh, <laughs> COVID-19, I don't know about anybody else, but that's certainly um, threw a wrench into our, our plans. But um, the EFC was working from home. We were working from home. You know, it was certainly um, not something that we were used to, but we got through it. We did get the design approved finally in July. And by August, we had bid it out and awarded it. And we thought we were going to be farther along uh, than we are now, but um, the, the work did begin in September. There were a few holdups. One, the Forest Park Pavilion was being worked on and we couldn't put our actual uh, project around the Forest Park Pavilion until that contractor was done with his job. So <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about the different green infrastructure practices that we are putting in, including bioswales, permeable pavement, which um, it's like, just laying pavement and then the rainwater harvesting system as well as pervious pavers. What you're again looking at here is you're looking at the fairgrounds track, you're looking at the forest park pavilion, this is the uh, grandstand, um, and then this is the Nichols building. I'm going to overlay the design on top of it. So we've kind of split it up into area one, area two, um, we have area three and area five. So I'll start with area one. So these were existing pictures of area one. We have the Nichols building in the corner right here. There was a lot of water buildup uh, runoff that came from the parking lot wood puddle here came up from the uh, actual roof would uh, does uh, tend to puddle here and then all the runoff that comes from this parking lot um, doesn't really have an outlet um, so they actually planned a bioswale uh, a green area that captures and treats runoff and that is planned along this fence line to be connected to uh, other drainage in the area. And by a bioswale or bioretention swale, this is kind of a cross section or the makeup of what uh, a swale actually looks like. You've got the top grass filter strip. Um, underneath the first layer, you're looking at the ability of, of water to pond underneath, followed by a, a series of uh, engineered soil or mulch topsoil, filter fabric stone, and uh, pipe for the uh, water once it's actually filtered down into that area um, to have an outlet. And this is an example of the actual Department of Social Services building. This is uh, right behind our office. This area uh, takes all of this runoff from the parking lot and actually goes into this little swale area right here. And there's plantings in there that absorb and filter um, the material that, that come off of the parking lot and then actually outlets into a drainage um, going in that direction. So then we have area two and we have a, a few different projects going on in area two, which is the actual forest park pavilion. Right here, we are actually planning pervious pavers and we have drainage issues here. All the runoff that comes off of the parking lot does, or not, or off the roof and then comes down through this parking area does tend to puddle right here. And unfortunately it puddles in a low spot, which is right beside a drop inlet that's a little bit higher. So water doesn't really have an inlet until it raise, reaches a, a certain height. So then we also have the driveway that goes into, this is you know, a concreted area. The pervious pavers will be placed here along with a bioswale right beside it. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about pervious pavers. So you're looking at a concrete um, 
material that actually has uh, grout or gaps in it. That gaps, those gaps could be uh, filled with stone or sometimes sand and they were installed over a bed of stone. So this is kind of a cross section here of the bed of stone um, and the different types of um, stone size. You've got open graded coarse bedding, um, a bedding reservoir, sub base and drainage to actually allow the um, water once it's gone through this pervious pavement to get out. So the pervious pavers allow, um, it reduces the nutrients entering the waterways, reduce the amounts of water that's actually coming to a combi combined sewage overflow. It traps uh, vehicle and other pollutant pollutants and also allows melting snow and ice to infiltrate. This area two we have here is still the Forest Park Pavilion, but we will have uh, rainwater collection and reuse right here. So I think it's about a quarter of the roof of the Forest Park Pavilion, which is really quite a big roof. Um, a quarter of that roof, the water will be uh, retained in two 1500 gallon storage tanks. And those that water will be able to be reused. Now there's little memorial gardens and, and things all over the park park that um, this water could be reused for. It could also be used for irrigation. Um, and then, like I said, we have the bioretention or bioswale um, right here. This is kind of uh, a breakdown of what a, a typical rainwater collection and reuse system looks like. You've got a gutter, usually a screen that's actually preventing um, fl uh, leaves and other debris, branches, what have you, not branches, but you know, twigs coming down into the gutter and, and blocking the gutter. Then you've got your first flush um, that is drained after the rain. You've got your storage tanks, which here it just has one. We will have two. I'll have a pipe overflow. And in this case, you know, in this particular picture, there's a rain garden, um, which ours will actually um, be utilized all throughout um, the uh, uh, fairgrounds. So then we have area five. So area five right here, this is the parking lot and this is the main drive. You've got the actual uh, playground right here, which does not have uh, an ADA compliant uh, entrance. So we thought because of the significant amount of water that actually runs across here has actually gullied down here and creates a problem for the Forest Park Pavilion. So one way to prevent that is to put the pervious pavement, now these are not the pavers, this is the pavement um, right here, and then below that we'll actually have another uh, bioswale or retention pond. Um, and we'll also have an ADA compliant paver installation that will actually go to the um, playground so that um, it is wheelchair accessible. This area three, again, you're looking at uh, the playground, but down here is where the actual bioretention area will be as well as another bioretention area down by the um, grandstand. So the first thing that had to be done actually was to move this building and then one of the trees had to go in order to create that uh, bioretention area. So this is an example of some of the previous pavement at the DSS building and this is an example of, you know, what it looks like when it rains. You know, this is certainly uh, immediately after the previous pavement was down, it, you know, is a higher functioning than, you know, after, if it's not cleaned out, if it, the sand is not removed, that kind of thing. But um, sand is not spread on these areas, um, but salt is so that uh, it can uh, keep, uh, keep the walkways open. But <clears throat> let's see. So yeah, I've seen you, shown you a lot of projects. There are a lot of the pictures of the actual DSS building, but this is actually of the um, 
the project that is still underway. We started in, let's see, we started in late August. We're delayed two or three weeks by um, one of the contractors um, not related to this project, but um, the parking lot excavation uh, has uh, gone through. They did put the stone down, the under drain down as well, the fabric as well. And so that's just waiting for the actual pavement, uh, the pervious pavement uh, to be laid on top. Some of the stormwater drop inlets um, that are leading from one bioretention area to another bioretention area um, are almost complete. The, the trench is dug, the, the main infrastructure is there, now the connections need to be fi made uh, final. Down on the bottom left, there's the final layer of uh, smaller stone that um, will make it ready for the pervious pavement. And then the next picture uh, with the shovel in it actually has the entrance to the playground where there will be pervious pavers and making it uh, wheelchair accessible. Then we have again the open trench from the playground area down to the outlet and then this is the actual outlet. So I believe the yeah this picture was a picture that was taken today so there's been project delays like I said um, the big question of our ownership uh, versus easement of the project uh, the design review process I think we were all uh, a big learning curve um, and working with people uh, that we haven't worked with before and uh, doing projects we haven't done before so um, one thing we also thought was one of going to be one of our bigger problems is the product availability um, we are in a rural area, we certainly sometimes have difficulty, you know, finding um, product available close by, but fortunately we have been able to find um, porous pavement. And um, so hopefully by next week, we will see the porous pavement down um, and we'll move on to all the other little projects. And Jen, I don't know here if we wanted to do <clears throat> that second poll. Sure. Let's see here. We want to pull my continue. We don't want this one. Hold on. That's not the one we want. All right. Here we go. Okay, so what does green infrastructure do? It mimics mother nature. It restores the natural hydrology, protects soil from erosion, and then there's all of the above. We've got 11, 12. <laughs> They've all passed the quiz, Michelle. They have. <laughs> <laughs> they were listening. <laughs> all right. Well, good job, everyone. Yes, um, I know that, like I said, we talk about green infrastructure a lot and nobody really kind of peels the layers off to uh, um, get down to describing what exactly it does do, especially if you're not, you know, in the field and doing it all the time. So, but um, unless anybody has any questions, that's all I have. All right, is there anybody with any questions they want to put in the chat for Nichelle? Okay, Tom has a question. Yes. It says, how is the other porous pavement holding up that you installed in the more recent years? How is the one at the DSS building holding up? Okay, so um, structurally it's holding up fine. Um, makes it interesting when people are wearing heels across the parking lot sometimes because oh. it is porous. But, um, but you can see um, in high traffic areas, you can start to see the compression of the porous pavement in high traffic areas. So what we have, we have a circular driveway um, in front of the DSS building and our buses 
um, turn around there. So that could mean our public buses, it could mean our school buses, um, there's no other place in town to turn around, so they turn around there a lot. So it's, you, you can see that there is, you know, certain areas it's not as absorbent, it, it, it doesn't absorb as much um, as the areas that aren't driven on as much. The other thing is you do get um, a lot of sand but it comes from the vehicles. So um, we do tend to spread more sand here in uh, Lewis County than salt, um, especially on the town roads and in the villages. And so that sand build up underneath the tires, um, you can notice it does build up. And so that has to be cleaned out, vacuumed and brushed. Kind of like uh, cleaning your house, huh? <laughs> Yep. Thank you, Tom, for that question. Any other questions for Nichelle? All right. I'm going to, if you don't mind, put this back up. And I'd like to say thank you to Christine and Nichelle for talking to us today about the work going on in the Black River watershed in your conservation districts. And thank you for always looking for opportunities to move this important work forward and for keeping your partners engaged. Um, here's the upcoming list of uh, schedule of webinars that we have for you with the Black River Watershed Conference. These are on our website. Tomorrow we will be, be featuring in similar fashion Hamilton and Herkimer County Soil and Water Districts. Uh, next week you won't want to miss our keynote. Uh, with Peter Hayes of Constable Hall and Dr. Lori Rush with Fort Drum Cultural Resources talking to us about the early history of the Black River watershed. So thank you all for attending this afternoon and we'll hope to see you very soon. Thank you, Jen. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Got some thank yous from Carla and Emily and uh, Joe Cleveland. All right. Okay. I will talk to you lady shortly. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.